Hi, I'm Aaron from Living Science Videos. Why do individuals of the same species vary in how they look, function, and behave? In other words, why aren't the individuals of sexually reproducing species identical like they usually are in asexually reproducing species? Why aren't you a nearly identical clone of your parents like the asexual species of top minnows that we talked about in an earlier video on sexual versus asexual reproduction? Why are siblings different or why do they have different traits like different eye colors? The short answer is the evolution of sexual reproduction from asexually reproducing organisms. There's nothing X-rated here because we're still talking about microbial genetics in the distant past. There are some criticisms that attempt to find fault with the evolution of sexual reproduction, like this one, called Something Fishy About the Evolutionary Origin of Sex. Now let's have a look and see if any of his criticisms have validity. The author says that according to evolution, the first cell somehow replicated asexually. By this, I guess he means the first living cell. Prior cells would have already been replicating long before achieving homeostasis, which they would have to do before they could be considered alive. He continues, saying that about a half billion years ago, some marine organism developed a mutation, even though mutations are not developed. This wouldn't have been a mutation anyway, and it should have happened more than a billion years earlier than he says. Anyway, he goes on to say that this mutation, he imagines, uh, caused the organism to develop some sexual characteristics. At this stage, there are no sexual characteristics, but we'll get to that in a moment. Anyway, he, next he imagines that at this exact same time, another member of the same type of marine organism also developed a mutation that resulted in it developing the opposite yet complementary sexual characteristics as the other mutated individual. So he thinks that evolution suggests that one microbe became male and that another one somewhere else became female with no connection to each other and that they then needed to find each other in order to reproduce. Worse than that, he goes on to say that these organisms were already multicellular, that they were the first ones to sexually reproduce by releasing eggs and sperm into the water. Eggs and sperm can only be produced by multicellular organisms. We're not there yet. This type of spawning doesn't require sexual characteristics either. Those are more efficient, but they didn't develop until much later. Finally, he says that this proved to be so successful that a number of other marine organisms developed the same mutations to make them male and female, as if one batch of microbes without eyes saw another batch and said without brains, look what they're doing, let's do that. No, these traits were inherited and the more successful populations preferentially perpetuate the traits that made them successful. That's how natural selection works. But this guy doesn't want you to know that natural selection works. That's why he's using such an embarrassingly wrong argument, especially for a grown man attempting to teach other adults. There is definitely something fishy here, but it's not what he wants you to think. In this brief high school primer on the evolution of sex, we're going to use this argument as an example of every way you can get that wrong. So if he doesn't understand this even at a high school level, then how could he have a Master of Science degree? And the short answer is that he doesn't. Not a real one, because he didn't go to a real school. He went to an institute with offices in two states that both denied that institute credentials to grant such advanced degrees, because they don't teach science. They're trying to trick people into not understanding or accepting science, especially evolution. So they twist that into something it isn't and explain it all wrong to confuse people who might have understood it otherwise. Maybe they don't know any better, and maybe they don't want to. Either way, this author has some fairly common misconceptions about the evolution of sexual reproduction. The actual hypothesis is more like this, that sexual reproduction began with single-celled microbes. The first step in that direction was a form of horizontal gene transfer called conjugation, a parasexual means of exchanging genetic material directly through a rupture in the cell wall. This is essentially what happens when a sperm invades an egg. Your individual cells reproduce through mitosis, but you as a multicellular collective reproduce through gamete cells, the sperm and egg. These are produced through meiosis. According to cytology and genetics, meiosis is apparently a modified version of mitosis just done over differently, although the daughter cells are different and you'll see that in a moment. You may want to review our earlier video on cell division and regulation to fully compare these two reproductive cycles. There are advantages to producing genetically identical clones of yourself, but then they're only going to change through cumulative mutations, and that takes a while. Most people think of evolution as being slow and gradual, but there are ways to speed it up. For example, multicellular organisms evolve faster than unicellular, if measured in generations, and sexual reproduction shifts up the speed too, because then you're mixing your genes with those of a partner. 
these mixes immediately increase genetic variability and thus adaptability, whether it is to changing environments or resisting disease. In order for reproduction to work, there needs to be a way to make a faithful copy of the parent organism. Think of it this way, if you've ever tried to copy a song or a movie, copies of copies don't have the fidelity of the original. Now, lucky for us, we don't reproduce that way, we re reproduce organically. There are, however, occasional errors copying parent DNA and offspring. These are called mutations. Mutations cause subtle changes in DNA, and most mutations are neutral, provide neither benefit nor harm. There are advantageous and detrimental mutations too, but this blend of DNA and the copying process, as well as natural selection, combine to eliminate detrimental mutations and accept advantageous ones. Both parent organisms in sexual species carry instructions for reproducing offspring. We're talking about genes now. Genes are specific sections of DNA on each chromosome. Different organisms have different numbers of chromosomes, and it's tempting to conclude that the more complex an organism is, the more chromosomes it has, like the programming code for increasingly complicated video games. But this is not the case in biology. The organism with the most chromosomes that scientists have ever studied is a single-celled protozoa called Oxytrica trifilax. It has about 15,600 chromosomes. The multicellular animal with the most chromosomes is the Acridaceous shirami butterfly. It has 268. Humans have 46 chromosomes. They have one set of 23 chromosomes from their mother and another similar set from their father. The two sets of chromosomes are homologous, which means that each chromosome has a matching duplicate. A cell that contains both sets of chromosomes, one from each parent, is called diploid, however, Human sperm and egg are called germ cells, no, not germs like what you're thinking. They're haploid, meaning that they have only a single set of chromosomes where a complete organism needs two. Chromosomes formed into X shapes, where each half is called a chromatid. In mitosis, these are pulled in half, and then each half is copied on either side of the cell, so that when the cell divides in cytokinesis, each chromatid has been duplicated into a whole chromosome. And the result of mitosis is to create two identical copies of the cell. Meiosis follows similar steps as mitosis, twice over in fact, and all the stages are labeled as 1 and 2. Just as with mitosis, DNA forms into chromosomes and then prepares for division before the prophase. But then things get a little weirder. After the chromosomes condense, they pair up in the metaphase. Here complete chromosomes from the mother and father combine and even intertwine so tightly that they exchange some of their genes in a process called crossing over. What a creative name. The anaphase is when the chromosomes split apart after exchanging parts, creating two pairs of chromosomes that end up creating the nucleoid of the new cells in the telophase. Each chromatid are not the same. After this, meiosis II begins. Using the cells made in meiosis I, the chromosomes condense into prophase II and line up again in the metaphase II. In anaphase II, the sister chromatids split up and flow to opposite sides. Then, the cells split again, creating a total of four cells with just one chromatid in each chromosome. So the original two sets become four uniquely different chromatids. This time, they're not copied or duplicated, they're haploid, each cell having half the DNA that it needs. In males, each of these would become a sperm. In females, one of these would become larger than the others and will become the egg. The others are called polar bodies and serve no purpose at all in animals. Plants use them to nourish the seeds. Sperm and egg cells are also called gametes, and when the gametes conjugate, they combine their haploid DNA to become a diploid zygote, which then grows into a different descendant, a new baby whatever it is. In meiosis, homologous chromosomes combine with the germ cells of the other parent to produce offspring. You may see haploid cells noted with the letter capital N. Diploid cells are noted with 2N, so human cells are noted as 2N equals 46. Did you know that some animals can reproduce sexually, but without sex? One day, in a lab in the UK, a cichlid fish gave birth to dozens of eggs by growing male organs and fertilizing them by herself. So sexual reproduction offers significant evolutionary advantages. That's why so many different plants and animals use it. But not everything does. In a previous video, we mentioned the New Mexico whiptail lizards, which produce diploid chromosomes in meiosis and give birth to identical clones of itself. It is an entirely female species because without sex, it isn't possible for a female lizard to produce male offspring. Actually, Aaron, you're wrong. 
In Komodo dragons, the sex chromosomes work a little different. Instead of XX being female and XY being male, the sex of Komodo dragons, along with fluffy dinosaurs like birds and some lizards, is determined by W and Z, with ZZ being a male instead of WZ. Therefore, in female Komodo dragons, there is both W and Z, allowing either to be passed down, creating a 50-50 shot at being male or female, even in virgin births. Thank you.